it's these kinds of stories which just blew my mind when I first started to get into this stuff. And um, we'll look in this video at just one of many, many cases of a type of disorder called agnosia. Agnosias or the agnosias. Uh, agnosia. And if I mean, if I go over to Wikipedia, we can see that there are many, many different types of agnosia, all these different things. And they're perceptive disorders. We have the inability to recognize text, to perceive motion, many, many different types. And what's interesting here is that this is nothing to do with damage in the eyes. A person with the inability to perceive motion, this echinotopsia, it has no damage to the eyes, it's a damage to a part of the brain that allows them to, that produces that conscious experience of motion. Um, and we have this huge list of many, many different types of agnosia. What we'll be talking about is a kind of visual form agnosia that occurred in a patient called DF uh, in the literature. They're often given these abbreviations or kind of code names. Um, a patient DF suffered some damage to a specific part of the brain. This is some scans of the damage to a brain, parts of the inferior temporal cortex, which is kind of around here. As we lead from the occipital lobe towards the temporal lobe, we have the inferior temporal cortex. And there was some damage there. And this really gives rise... It's these kinds of studies that, that give rise to a lot of speculation and ideas about this modular functioning in the brain, this idea that different parts of the brain perform different functions, and often in ways that are counterintuitive to the way we thought the brain worked. What we tend to, we'll, we'll look at this when we get to a video on lesion studies later on, but what this, what we really can ask in these kinds of cases is, is kind of, one, what are the deficits brought about by a certain type of damage? Deficits, my handwriting's terrible, that's maybe a deficit. Um, the, we could ask, what are the deficits? We could ask, what's left intact? What skills, capabilities, and behaviors are left intact uh, within this person by this disorder, by this trauma to the brain. And then we could perhaps use those bits of information to infer something about the function of that part of the brain that was damaged or lost. Um, and this is perhaps one thing that we could do. And let's do that in this situation of DF. So DF um, suffered some damage due to, I think it was carbon monoxide poisoning that caused this damage in parts of the brain. And when she went into uh, the, to be um, the, her doctor, she began to uh, refer her on to some people who did some research, and she was put through some kind of perceptive tests, some of which were to, to copy drawings. It was noticed that she couldn't quite recognise objects that were in front of her. Even though she could describe them reasonably well, she couldn't recognise what they were. So... Give it put in, when when an an apple was uh, put in front of her, she was asked to copy this drawing of an apple. This is her drawing. As you can see, it's nothing like the apple. Um, so she she couldn't use the visual information entering her brain to to um, in order to reproduce that to to create a perception and therefore to draw what she was seeing. Uh, from memory, she could draw a reasonable apple like this. And the same for this picture of a book here. She, this was her attempt to copy this drawing. This was her attempt to draw a book from memory. So we had two, some very strange differences already beginning to emerge. Um, but, but what... This isn't quite the most astounding part. What really came of this was when she was asked to perform what was called kind of a card slot orientation test, where we had a, a board perhaps with with a slot cut into it like a post box but it was vertical in this case we could see from the results and she was asked then to and we have to get a very clear distinction there are two conditions two things she was asked to do and they're slightly different and this slight difference gave rise to a whole notion of different pathways in the brain for different things we'll see this ds here is the dorsal stream that runs upward and then we have the vs here which is the ventral stream and we'll talk about these in a second so what happened when she was asked to do this in the first case she was asked to look at the look at the slot on the board and orient an envelope to the same orientation as that slot. So not to post it, not yet, not posting anything yet, just to look at the slot, then to look at her envelope, look at the slot, look at the envelope, and try and orient them to the same thing. And what did she get? Well, she orient she ended up with this. This these are the results of DF's test on this in this test. So. Um, 
she got it every which way. It didn't really, it was just seemed to be random. She couldn't get it right. She couldn't quite bring it into attention. She couldn't uh, discern the orientation enough to, to orient the object. Whereas a normal person, this is the control, a normal person can get it right almost every time, or every time. That's a very good result there. In the second scenario, what occurred was that they, they asked her not to, to orient the card, but just to post it, just just go for it, you know, just post the card through the slot. And what happened is that she got it right most of the time. You can see now she's got it much closer to her, the control who gets it right every time. We have somebody now who is... Uh, and what ex how do we explain this difference? Surely, if she cannot judge the orientation of the of the slot how can she possibly orient her hand to post the the slot what's the difference between these two but the difference seems to be in these things the dorsal stream and the ventral stream and these were given names after these kinds of tests after cases like this it gave rise to this idea that of the the, the dorsal ventral hypothesis you could say the dorsal stream which goes from, so the visual information comes from the eyes, moves across to the occipital lobe, and then gets divided up for different functions. We have the dorsal stream, which is sometimes called the, the where pathway, or the I, I like to call it the how pathway, or the action pathway. Um, and also the ventral stream, the ventral stream, uh, which is this one that moves out towards the, the temporal lobe. And we, we noticed that it was the ventral stream, it was around this area that was damaged in DF by the carbon monoxide poisoning. And this is sometimes called the what pathway. So we have the what pathway and the how pathway or the where pathway. And why are they given these names? Well, it seems that in, in the first instance, just as in the, these instances where she's trying to copy a drawing, in the first case where she's just asked to look at the thing, look at the slot and orient something, she's really been asked to recognize what is out there. And visual information gets travels to the occipital lobe and then in order to recognize what's out there the ventral stream seems to have something to do with that so because that's damaged she was unable to recognize what is out there but um the the dorsal stream then is called the how pathway and this seems to be the pathway that that to allows us to use visual information to to guide our movements, to reach out and pick up the coffee cup, to interact with the world. How are we going to use visual information to interact with the world? How is that is that information going to inform our movements? And so that's what the dorsal stream seems to do. Now notice that these are um, things that we thought would have been intrinsically linked. If I, I have to look at my coffee cup in order to guide my hand towards it, and I, I keep looking at it as I move my hand, and I think that it's my recognition of the coffee cup and where the handle is that allows me to move towards it. Um, but it seems we have a dissociation. This is called a dissociation between the two pathways. There is a lot of, I mean, I'm over-exaggerating here, there's a lot of um, links between the two pathways. There are neurons that connect between the two, but this is a kind of broad overview. This is kind of an extreme example that these two are so harshly divided um, and and in so when she was asked to just turn the envelope and post it in that case the dorsal stream came into play and she was able to orient the card and post it straight through and that again I mean for me this just was amazing to see this dissociation between these things that we would have thought would have been intrinsically linked in the brain but there's this dissociation and this is something we'll see again and again and again over many many case studies in many many different aspects of our conscious perceptive experience so i hope this sparks some curiosity and just kind of it's a bit curious as to how this can occur and the fact that there are these two different pathways for vision in the brain and there are many more i assure you so we'll we'll, we'll look at perhaps some of those in other videos